Hi. Thanks for responding. Um, <laughs> my name is Rachel Morillo. I am the DAJ Director of Public Engagement and Research here at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Philadelphia. And I'm really excited to welcome you all tonight for the first um, this season in our series of lectures in partnership with Weitzman School of Design. Uh, tonight, we have the honor of hearing Kevin Jerome Everson speak on his work. Um, to share a bit about the space that you're in for those who, those of you who might be here for the first time, we've been here, or we've been around for about 60 years now. We're about to celebrate our 60th anniversary, and our focus as an institution is really li uplifting the work of underrepresented, uh, historically marginalized, and emerging artists, and so. We have a very long history of doing so with some exciting work. I think that the shows that are up right now are really indicative of the kind of work that we show. So th the galleries are unfortunately closed right now, but we are always free and open Wednesdays through Sundays from 12 to 6. So if you have time and are ever getting a hankering for some more art, I welcome you all back into this space. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to M, who will be introducing Kevin tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Kevin Jerome Emerson to the ICA and to start this year's um, Artist Talk series. Um, as a true mega fan for many, many years, um, it is really an honor to give this introduction. Kevin's prolific career, which includes photography, installation, paintings, and over 200 experimental films, is a testament to his unwavering dedication to produce and to think through life's big questions with art. Often shooting in 16 millimeter, his films blur the lines between fiction and realism. They are woven together from found footage and historical footage, scripted and staged scenes, still photography, and edited archival film, creating a mosaic of visual storytelling. He'll fabricate tiny details, frame archival video in unexpected ways, and will stage events that may seem like documentary at first, but are in fact carefully constructed narratives. His films challenge us to engage actively in the meaning of content, inviting us to explore and interpret the stories he presents. Kevin's work relentlessly breaks down the formal and perceptual boundaries of genres and art. It is this very character of his that inspired me to first pick up a camera and try to make sense of the world through a lens. Each of Kevin's films allow us to see the extraordinary within the ordinary. They celebrate life by emotions, gestures, and interactions that often go unnoticed sometimes because they are too uncomfortable or even simply deemed not important. His films remind us of the perpetual cycle of everyday life and the beauty, dignity, and flair that can come along with it. Often set in the Midwest or Southern United States, Kevin's work centers on the complexity of black life in these regions. His work is made without enforcing any specific representation. He allows the authenticity of his subjects to shine through with a special focus given to narratives surrounding economic migration, his work explores the intractability of labor and the impact it has on the cultures enmeshed within a trade or an industry. As many of you in this room know, I was a union organizer before I came to art school last year. In my mid-20s, I was introduced to Kevin's catalog and discovered his 1990 film, Second Shift. As if by fate, a month later, there was a screening of his eight eight-hour epic banger of a film, Park Lanes, that I can proudly say I managed to sit through in nearly its entirety, minus bathroom breaks and probably a, a snack or something. Um, <laughs> these works which put on display the ordinary brutality and escapability of work were the first I had ever seen that reflected my understanding and relationship to labor. They showed me that film could have a powerful place in a very urgent conversation. In Kevin's world, translation of meaning through repetition is an important aspect of his practice. 
His films often reveal connecting themes slowly over time, leaning on the accumulation to fully grasp their depth and complexity. The intentional opacity serves as a reaction to the debates of politics and representation in cinema, as Kevin rejects the role of cultural explainer and places the onus of understanding on the audience. I feel like art, capital A art, doesn't quite know what to do with Kevin. And that might be exactly why he is so beloved and influential. Not exactly a documentarian, not exactly a cultural commentator. He is a maker who defines his own form for each and every film that he makes. Whether providing an uninterrupted perspective on a very specific activity or employing a deft melodic editing technique to reveal connections across time and space, Kevin's films never fail to challenge our perceptions and demand our engagement. The impact of Kevin's work extends far beyond the screen. He has garnered recognition from renowned film festivals around the world. He has received mid-career retrospectives at the Harvard Film Archive, the Tate Modern, the Modern and Contemporary Art Museum in Seoul and South Korea, along with countless more recognitions of his mastery as a filmmaker and contributions to the field. I wanted to end this introduction with a short anecdote. Um, a few years back, I was supposed to work for Kevin. Um, we were both living in Berlin at the time, and he needed help filming a project involving cars and driving. Um, this was the winter and spring of 2020. Um, needless to say, we were never able to meet up and shoot, um, and as far as I knew, the project was put on indefinite hold. But about a month or so into lockdown, I reached out just to see how he was holding up, and he sent me a photo of uh, the scene that he was trying to stage for the film using toy cars, because um, <laughs> that's all he could get his hands on. And I laughed, and I thought to myself, wow, he really can't help himself. Um, Kevin's love for art making and straight up tenacity for the projects he cares about has always inspired me. And even at that time, it really did push me to pick up my camera as well. Um, so if it wasn't incredibly obvious, I am so pleased um, to welcome Kevin Drone Everson. Oh, thanks, Em. Shoot, I could just go home now. <laughs> This thing, but anyway. But thanks for the introduction. Yeah, that's pretty moving. Um, I don't know, I'm just, like I just live in Charlottesville, so I don't think nobody sees the stuff I make. But I guess people do see it. But uh, but uh, but yeah. But today I'm just going to talk about uh, my working practice and how I make the stuff I make and my influences and stuff like that. So I like to show this image first. Um, that's that's me on the left, um, Santa Claus maker. And then uh, yeah, I like to show this because. Um, I was telling some friends earlier that uh, my aunt used to work for the newspaper, and around this time, well, this was published in 1970, and the Supreme Court ruling for busing was, was like in April, so my neighborhood was bused to this all-white school, so all the black kids were from my uh, neighborhood, from my block, and, but also, too, I mean, it was a kind of a fake, kind of happy integration picture, because my aunt would pick me and my brother and cousins to stage in these photographs, and she wasn't in my class physically and culturally. No, I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> no. that reef is like, Ugh. but that Santa Claus is, you know, like kicking. But, uh, but anyway, you know, so I like to, you know, like I grew up in this uh, kind of working class town, uh, Mansfield, Ohio. Um, my folks got there in the late 50s. Um, I don't know what kind of migration. They came up from Mississippi, Columbus, Mississippi, to be exact. And there was more jobs than people when I was young. Um, it was always there was a, like a General Motors, there's a Tappan, there's a Dominion. There was man, I worked at a Weston House factory. Um, there was all kinds of uh, things to do, and the town was like about 31 percent black, and like at its height, so it had all this kind of racial tension. And then I liked the I forgot who's I think it's a Malcolm X quote, but it's true that. Uh, the Mason-Dixon line is definitely the Canadian border. Um, so no matter, it's actually cooler in the south because rural is black. When you go up north, rural is white, and it's a little bit more scarier. But um, so I like it down south and stuff like that. But you know, you still get the same kind of people always like, oh, it's the south, the south. But it's always most of the resistance and stuff is up north and stuff like that. So, so the whole idea of integration was like big at this kind of uh, like kind of moment in history. And I do remember um, 
when I was young, when we, and I graduated high school in 83, and I think every spring we'd have race riots. And I was in elementary school, the race riots would start in the high schools on Monday and reach to the elementary schools by Wednesday and Thursday. So you had all this kind of stuff. And even my senior year, remember, we had like, like you know, just race riots would just be like going on for like three or four periods or whatever and stuff. So it was a pretty kind of tough time. But, uh, but, but anyway, but these are all, but all of this stuff kind of influences in the high sea and kind of, kind of react to the real world and stuff. But, but here's a couple of influences. Um, uh, the right is one of the, um, is Richard Pryor from Peoria, Illinois. He's probably one of the top eight artists this country's ever produced. Um, he's a comedian, those of you who don't know, he's an actor, and, um, and, um, and I remember, uh, y you know, my parents, like my mom was a bank teller, dad was a mechanic, so we didn't have art. So we had art in the house, but it wasn't traditional art. It was like comedy albums, music, because um, they were soul folks. They come up, where well, they grew up in the 50s, so we had soul music all the time. So I'm more of a soul kid than a hip-hop junkie, but a hip-hop junkie, but mostly soul. And Pryor was always, no matter, it was, you know, like he was a blue comic, and it means dirty comic. And uh, they never censored it from us. I mean, we'd just be listening to all kinds of jokes, and cause it, because, because it was high art. And, and then something, I'm, I'm going to brutal a joke here that he says, but, but he has a joke about dating and shit. And, and, it's, a, and it's about, um, you know, cunnilingus or something, you know. And then, he, and then he was telling, and then this is what I like about him. Like, he'll, he'll, like he'll start off saying that, I had an uncle who said, boy, don't ever do that. And he said, I couldn't wait to do that because my uncle's been wrong about everything in his life. <laughs> and I like the short description narrative of a person because we all, you know, because that, because just that one sentence is enough narrative. So for me, I like how he formulates his arena, um, his jokes and stuff by with that one little narrative thing. So we always know, so we always can identify that that individual, like he's always been wrong about everything. And, and then so you get a kind of almost a clear picture of that individual. The image on the left is like, I think it's my cousin Bobby Clark. He's a lot older than me. And I don't even know who took the picture, but I do remember my uncle, um, my Uncle Wanky, going to, um, at my brother's graduation. And I remember him taking pictures of my brother and his classmates and stuff. And, and I remember him tilting the camera and saying, that I'm going to make some art up in here. And and so what, 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 and I like the fact that one has to announce that they're making art. You know, you have to like you can't just make art. You know, it's not for everybody, whatever. But you have to kind of announce it. But also too, but what he was responding to was the strong diagonal lines, and so to speak. So the idea of like art is always there. You just get kind of like, I mean, you just got to kind of just just kind of like to get out of my. University of Virginia, Ivy League way of making art. There's, uh, like there's something's always in the community about making art, so to speak. And here, here's another influential. This is Lorna Hansberry, uh, died super young, talented playwright. And the, one of my favorite pieces of artwork is uh, Raisin in the Sun, her play. And in the fact that I remember, um, before I saw the play, I saw multiple iterations of the play, um, but I saw the Auto Primager movie um, with the same cast. Yeah. Yes, yes, as the same cast as as the play. And I like, I remember me and my brother were up late, and I was like young, like nine or 10 watching it. And I, I just remember the emotional roller coaster ride that this artist can put the viewer through. And so that was something that was very influential for uh, me, is like I'm right here, but like her writings. And uh, these are two artists that are um, Bootsy Collins from Cincinnati, Ohio, George Clinton from Plainville, New Jersey. And I don't know if people, no uh, Funkadelic, Parliament of Funkadelic, and then and, and Bootsy Collins. I remember I probably in the, probably about 10 years, I had only four albums in my entire life. Like maybe five, three Funkadelic albums, no, two Funkadelic albums, three Parliament albums, and a Bootsy Collins album. But it's all I needed, <laughs> and still do. But I like how, um, that they used to have all these concepts to do their albums. When they're, and for me, it's a work of art. Um, they have um, the Yaka Boogie, they're on the water, the Immersive Connection. Um, but one of my favorite piece, uh, pieces of art is a YouTube clip of um, uh, the Mothership Connection concert in Houston in 1975 and waiting for the Mothership. But also, if you listen to their, their music, it's funk, it's soul, and it's gospel. 
that are waiting for the mothership. It's not they're waiting for God or Jesus or Muhammad or whatever. It's the mothership to take us out of here. So, you know, so how they had these, but that's also how they gave me the you know, space to imagine. I know a lot of people like to use them for Afrofuturism, but for me it was Afro-present. <laughs> you had to be there, be young, it just when this stuff was coming out, because they were always taking the viewer, the listener, somewhere different. Like the Funkadelic albums would come out every summer, right before football practice, and uh, Parliament albums would come out every winter, and then that was enough for me, whatever. Um, and also, these, uh, th these artists are very interesting, the uh, official and Vice, and this piece was at the Wexner Center in Columbus, Ohio, and what they do is they make everything. I don't know if you know their work, but they carve everything out of polyurethane and paint it. And then again, I like the short things to get to a narrative. So then uh, you go behind the stairs and you peek in this uh, door window and, 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 and you see all these objects that are for, uh, for exhibition change and stuff like that. But just a little bit of gesture, like these painted objects that look like paint cans, but this one here is a little bit of paint in it. So it has a backstory. So again, like the Richard Pryor thing about the backstory about the uncle and about these like small painterly gestures to give it a kind of a narrative, kind of a backstory. It's very important to me, whatever. Um, is anybody from Detroit? There's a, there's a hand raised? Yeah, right. Uh, they might have been there with Grand Army Plaza, the street, the road in, in Detroit. But uh, this guy named like, um, so Davos, he has this whole like neighborhood painted with like you know, houses and buildings are painted. So it's just kind of like kind of famous space up there. And um, and I took this image, but what I mean, I was walking around the whole whole like this art thing that he makes, uh, whatever. And then like and then I intentionally stood right here, and I liked this. And then I took this image, you know, framed it up, whatever. Because I like the fact that the stumps and the cans are, are, are kind of similar formally, but they're doing two different things. And for me, just when I saw all of this, oh, well, this is a film edit. So this is something that, you know, that, that's formally kind of, kind of similar, but have a kind of conceptual jump to one thing or another. And so I'm always trying to see these um, this kind of formal disruptions and things and like editing, so to speak. So with seeing this was very influential and oh man, this is it. Yeah, so that's me <laughs> in the middle one. All these pictures are like almost 10 years old. That's my cousin, Bobby. Uh, everybody's Bob T, JC, LA, Baywick, DC, and PDQ. I'm the only one who doesn't have a nickname growing up. It's like Kevin, <laughs> unassuming. But uh, like I showed this, like image because, um, like I said, I grew up in Mansfield, Ohio. I haven't lived there since I was 18, but I go back all the time. My son was born there, and then I got a lot of family and parents are still there. And, you know, that. and I just remember, um, you know, I'd come home and talk to my son's mom about what's going on and stuff, and she would say, oh, you know Pooh Black? And it's like, I don't know, no Pooh Black. You know Pooh Black. Who's related to? Don't, I don't know. For like an hour, we'll debate about Pooh Black. And then after that, she said, never mind. Anyway. And then she'd get to this act two, whatever. And I was like, and it would frustrate me because my cousins do the same thing. Because I just moved away. I don't know anybody. But I realized what they're doing, and I'm doing the same thing formally. And I did this when I was walking to see him in Berlin. I actually thought about this when I was walking, I was walking down the street. Is I do the same fucking thing. It's just that I don't give you the act one. Like the setup is that, you know, if you write a script, you know, you got the act one is the setup and beginning of act two when you throw the character in the chaos and then hijinks ensues, whatever. I don't know, like narrative filmmaking. But, um, <laughs> you know, but anyway, but I like the fact that, like, I don't give people the setup neither, formally. Like I'll just throw people into the scene and then you got to catch up. And so what frustrates me when I go home, I'm like, I don't know Pooh Black. But, uh, but I think I do, so I probably frustrate the viewer too as well. So I do the same kind of thing, whatever. It's just that I just like, just throw you into chaos. And then so you, the author, uh, I mean you, the viewer, has to kind of catch up. And I like the fact that I do that because um, I was talking to, I think Rhonda, who's one of the guards here, 
And she remember seeing my drag racing film. I did a film about a drag racing family years ago. And I just have them all speak drag racing lingo. And I like the fact that the people on screen are smarter than the people in the audience, whatever, because then they gotta catch up. So I do the kind of same thing. Like I don't give, I, like I don't give the clear version of Act One, whatever, so to speak. But let me um, show some art. So, so um, I've done a lot of different art um, with, um, mediums. My degrees are in photography, actually both degrees in photography, but I did sculpture, printmaking, artist bookmaking, and I did some films in undergraduate and grad school, but not much. Just mostly documenting performances I was doing, so I was doing performance art. And, uh, but, but most of my main body of photography is done with this camera, it's called a Wide Lux. It was, it's a you know, Japanese uh, camera, and that's the years it was made, and it basically holds 35 millimeter film. Has anybody seen this camera before, or seen pictures from it? Um, and so the roll of 35 millimeters, so there's 36 frames. So this has 21 frames, so it's a kind of a panoramic-like image. And it has like three shutter speeds, a 15th of a second, like 125 and 250th of a second. And what you do is you snap the shutter here and the lens moves over the, um, like over the frame, um, over the picture plane. And and uh, let me just show, and so it creates this kind of image. Um, and this event here always occurs before the event over here because the lens is, is uh, moving. And as I like to, and I was liking using this camera, it's kind of a gimmick, I think, if you're looking at what, what photography, and it has a 17 millimeter lens, so it's super wide. So this individual here is probably like right here to me, whatever, she's like pretty close. So, so within the frame, since the camera was like kind of a verb, it was constantly moving, the frame would move. No, not the frame would move, but the lens would move, scan over the picture plane. So I've always, so when I was doing this body work, I was actually framing up individuals of African descent, either posing or performing or making art objects. So I figured I was privileged making art objects because in height, and then I figured if I, um, um, so, so like in, all, in always in these like uh, images, there was a potential for creation, so to speak. Like this picture, this guy's taking cameras, or these homemade signs and stuff like that. And then there's always like a snapshot for somebody and stuff. But I always keep the frame super active. So I'm gonna show a couple examples of them. Um, there's one from in South Carolina. I mean, I was just sitting on the porch drinking, and I was like, oh man, this kid's carrying a drum, you know. So like. Of course, I'm gonna take a picture. But also, I kind of tell people how to pose sometimes, whatever. So I like this, like the way her head kind of looks back into the frame. Um, this is at a contentious city council um, meeting, a meeting. So this is a 15th of a second. So you see, it's kind of blurry. You know, it's like kind of didn't kind of stop the moment, which is good. And then I think as I was going further in it, um, I was cropping off. You know, how y'all mixtapes, people creating stuff, and then, and then, and then the while I was like kind of cropping off kind of, uh, you know, heads and arms and stuff like that. I was, you know, then like the framing got a little bit more aggressive, whatever. So I was doing that body of work. And then in the 90s, I was also doing this body of work too. Um, Cause these things is how I got into making films. Um, um, so at the time, like I said, from Mansfield, Ohio, the factories were closing up. And, uh, or actually my, brother graduated school in 81, and I graduated in 90, in 83, and then there was no more factory jobs um, around that time. So his, my brother's friends, they all were retired from like uh, factory jobs, but my friends, they ended up joining the military, like Reagan's military and shit like that. And, but also too, we always had this prison in my hometown. Um, has anybody seen Shawshank Redemption? Yeah, that was shot there, an the old prison. It's the Ohio State Reformatory is the, the, the largest, the, the highest cell block in the country. No, in the world. It's six stories high. And then I just recently shot three films in there in January. Um, and now it's like a museum and shit. And then they have concerts in there. <laughs> they have heavy metal concerts in there. And, um, but then they build, uh, oh, and this, well, one of my favorite films. Um, you ever seen Air Force One? Oh, it's over the top. <laughs> So fucking incredible. And the Soviet prison is, that's, that's my hometown. Yeah, when they, just when he leaves. So I just made a film about that. But, 
But yeah, I love uh, Harrison. Oh, this is so unbelievably badly good. <laughs> and all the exposition in it and shit, it's so good. But anyway, but that was shot there. But all these other, and, and like Dude in the Black Messiah, I think it was the last one that was shot there. But anyway, but, but also too, but, but since they closed that down in 1990, that is like, uh, I mean, that just, I mean, it was just a complete plantation. It was, uh, the Ku Klux Klan had ran it. It was a, it was a mess. But anyway, so they closed it down from this court order. But they built two more prisons because they got a, you know, prisons. And so now, um, you know, my friends were getting jobs as prison guards. So in the state of Ohio, so we wanted crime in Cleveland. We wanted crime in Youngstown because I was just giving us more jobs, whatever, so to speak. So it was just all this kind of cycle. And then any time there's this movement of black folks going forward, there's always an institution that's going to bring us back. And well, you're going to see, and like in the early 90s, we had this multiculturalism. And, and then I hate when people use the word PC and shit, because that was like a right-wing term for what the, how people say woke now. So the same languages, you know, they get with it. You know, it's, I mean, it's always like, you know, it's just like anti-blackness, whatever. I'm mean, as simple as that. But, but, you know, so anyway, but this particular work I was doing was um, I was making, at the time I was making objects that were, that presented artwork in the home. Like, so I was making end tables that look like my mom's old end tables, and then I would make the photographs and the frames and put them in the home. And then, so what I was putting in there was like old graduation, like images from the 50s, and portraits of prison guards, because in the whole idea of like, when people, when the migration, like happened, the whole, when all my family was saying, oh, we went up north to do better, to do better, but better didn't happen, whatever, so to speak. Or better happened to some, but it didn't, I mean, but that whole dream to, uh, to uh, do better. But as I was like making these things, I was telling people, yeah, I'm making these, these end tables. I mean, I made a shitload of them. And then I was like, but I was really into how people would work five days a week get paid on Friday, buy an end table on Saturday, and put it in their homes. And then people kept saying, you should make films, because you're talking time base, whatever, time base and stuff. And then, you know, like, Ian was talking about labor and stuff, but I like how labor was changing the body and stuff. And I remember, um, and my mom, she cooked all the time. I remember in, in Mansfield, like, growing up, like, Burger King would shut down, because nobody would go to it, because people would eat at home all the time. But I remember um, Friday, my parents didn't cook, we'd get like, you know, take out, whatever, because they were tired. And I remember the bodies looked different from Monday to Friday, because they had the week on them. So I wanted, so my earlier films were about like movie, you know, were per, was about pre-performances, how the body was, how labor was changing. And, and I remember I said something I don't want nobody to do. I used to shoot dice, you know, a friend of mine used to shoot dice at, it <laughs> at his place. I just remember the guys come home, you know. I mean, he had to shoot dice early because the people would come home from work. And, and then I remember the steel mill workers, they're on the forearms. I, mean, I was a kid, but their forearms would be so huge. You know, their bodies would, you know, based on their labor and stuff and how they do. And then so I was really into that. So then, so that's how people were telling me, well, you should start making films. So these, so these objects kind of got the, and actually it was Isaac Julian, uh, the, 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 the black British filmmaker that was telling me about you should be making films and stuff. They're showing them these kind of, Bob, these work. But, but then I started making films about like immigration, uh, not immigration, but about, um, um, about migration. And then, uh, and then I was always curious about who got to Mansfield. And, and then, it did, and, it, and it just like I said, the Mason-Dixon line is the Canadian border, but uh, Mansfield, Ohio, which is like an hour, 10 minutes south of Cleveland, um, it's a very southern town. Like all the whites are from Kentucky and West Virginia, and all the blacks are from Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. So, you, so the very southern, just like America. Like, I mean, you go up to, to upstate New York, and you'll see Confederate. Like, I remember going to Martha's Vineyard in the 90s and seeing boats with Confederate flags and stuff. So, I mean, it's Canadian border. So, but anyway, so, but, but this particular film is called Company Line, and I'm gonna show a little clip from it. And so, it's, um, so I made it kind of a trilogy of films about the first three black neighborhoods. And one of them was Company Line, and there were people who work at the steel mill. And so as I had people tell the story, I had snowplow truck drivers tell the story, because they're out there plowing snows, and, and then a lot of these streets from these cities, from these neighborhoods, would didn't exist anymore. So I was asking these snowplow truck drivers about their work and where they're from, 
and then and, and, and just getting a little bit of history, you know, was kind of doing the um, um, uh, the Richard Pryor joke, you know, not not making not making that kind of joke, but the whole idea of, of like just giving them a prompt, and then you hear people's work history, then and and then you get a sense of the area like they're from. So here's a scene. <laughs> It didn't snow much when I was there, so I got a lot of salt. Salt is the worst. The way we're getting for here. Oh, a bunch of places. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> Man's little time. Wild Brass. Great man. Brooklyn. Ain't like my room. Uh, let's see. Artesian. Western House. Himself. My dad on the as well. <laughs> Scrap yard. Ski slopes. How about you uh, Yeah, we're, we're down the street. Now you want to go in and she in the service? Yeah, I had a daughter. She just got back in my rack. And then, and then like, I like his pauses and stuff. And yeah, so, you know, and then and the, I like these kind of small, you know, and then so I asked multiple, like, like some pipe drivers, where they're from, and how, and when you, and then what time they got here. But if you live in a small town like Mansfield, and then in, in, in the late aughts, and you go to the post office, and, and you see a lot of individuals with one arm, one leg, because these are people who went to kind of bushes like the like the um, army, and then went into Iraq and stuff like that. So around that time, folks were just kind of coming back and coming back. But anyway, so um, I think. I think she lost a f couple of fingers. I think his daughter did. But, but anyway, so anyway, so so then that's the kind of um, you know, you know, and then so the film kind of gave me a chance, like unlike the end tables, what they talk about uh, migration to as well. But the films gave gave, gave me this t chance to kind of kind of edit and put all these things together, and then talk about uh, migration. And this particular film here, um, but this is one of the first. I think this is the first feature film I did that has 11 minute takes. So each take is a full magazine of film because each uh, 60 millimeter film, a magazine holds 400 feet or 133 meters and it's a 10 or 11 minute take and stuff. So I was making films based on like everything had to happen within this take. And so in this particular film, Erie, it, I mean, it starts off with this billboard where they advertise blacks to move up north and then that's the first take and the last take is, has anybody been to Niagara Falls that made it a mess? You ride on a boat and shit and you get splashed. <laughs> but the, like the hardcore splash when you're in Canada. So it was almost like an underground railroad way of doing this film with long takes and about jobs and stuff. But in this particular scene, uh, like I'm gonna show two scenes. So it's kind of like those stumps and uh, those, um, the, the stumps and the paint cans, whatever. So um, just when I got, when I was making this film, my cousin Daisy and Sadie, they had just retired from GM at age 54. They spent 30 years in the factory and they're making a ton of money. And then my cousin Ed was still working there. So then I had them talk about their experience in the factory. And then of course, the next scene is something that I figured that was gonna work conceptually. So I'll show you the end of one scene and beginning of another scene, so. Because I, I actually talked to a guy. Uh, so they're talking like GM talk with inside. Yeah. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm, I'm retiring. He said, good for you. He said, because I have 15 years. I can't go nowhere. Right. I can't retire. I can't take the grow into. I can't take the mutual. He said, I am stuck. And he said, am I angry? Yes, I am angry because I'm losing big time. You know, he said, I can't do anything. I got to stay here until this plant closed. Yeah, and I understand that with him. I sympathize for him, too. But, you know, even with my situation, I'm missing the mutual by four months. Yeah. But, you know, like I say, I'm not angry about it. I'm willing to, to, to go somewhere else, wherever they want to send me right now. You know, I, I, I'm in the home stretch. Mm -hmm. I got 23 years, seven more years I can retire. So, mm -hmm. 
it's, it would be ludicrous for me to give up 23 years for $115,000. Yeah. It's not going to do me any good. And, and then that one guy, he missing about six days. Right. Oh, yeah. Six so days. It's he different six for days. everybody's situation. Right. Yeah. Everybody, have a, everybody got a story. Everybody right. have a different situation, you know. And, and, it's, and it's, it took it's, like 30 it's minutes to get talking about the GM and stuff like that. So I used the third take. And, the, and this is the second take after that. So I just remember going to, um, oh, um, um, I went, so I was shot this up in Buffalo, and then I went to um, Pittsburgh on the park, I think it was the Tempest, and then there was two black actors, I met them on Monday night, I took them to lunch on Tuesday, I hired a fight coach on Wednesday, and we shot it on Friday, and then so I was thinking about um, what to go after the workers, and then I was thinking, so since this is the first time I did a, a film where you don't sit there and watch each take for 10 minutes, and then I was thinking about like how, um, how the viewers invested into it, but also I want the subject matter within the frame to be invested into themselves, so to speak. Like, just like what the General Motors factory people kind of talk to themselves, just kind of it being self-referential. Uh, like pretty much, and then so I thought, oh, I'll just have these guys do a sword fight, but they'll get up and, you know, and you know, keep doing the same thing over and over again, just like the repetition stuff. And then I remember the fight coach said, said, what do you want them to use? And then I said, I want them to use the loudest thing because swords are made by hand. So I was thinking of what, so every time I see a General Motors car, I think of my, you know, my cousin Bobby Taylor, Ed, Daisy, Papa Shep, you know, working on these cars, and I see their DNA and their footprints and their fingerprints on these cars. And so I wanted, it, and for me, everything feels like it's made by hand. So I wanted a sword that was like kind of a saber that was made by hand. So that was the kind of conceptual bridge I wanted from one shot to with the uh, next. And this particular film, it's a short one. It's only eight hours. And uh, so it's park lanes. And then so I used to make dryers at a Westinghouse factory the worst job, but the most education I had in my life, whatever, I was like 20. And I took a guy's place who stormed the beach at Normandy, and he had just retired. You know, so I give you a sense, he was working in these places. So I was like, oh man, you know, so what was it like? I want to talk about it. I was like, all right. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. So anyway, but anyway, you know, I was working in there, and then I realized how, what was valuable and what was not valuable. And then, so I wanted to shoot in the factory. So one of my favorite artists is a guy named Lob Diaz. Is anybody hip to this cat? He's a, Filipi oh yeah, he's a Filipino filmmaker. Just gorgeous man in general, just like really hip. And then like he makes these long eight, nine hour films. And then, you know, if it takes 20 minutes for an ox to cart to go up the road, it takes 20 minutes for the ox and cart to go up the road. But the one thing is that the longer the take is, the more invested you are in the character. So I think it's got that film, I think it's Diary of a Filipino Family or something. And this guy gets stabbed and he like yells in the rain in the woods for about 50 minutes. And you just, and then, and then like you're checking your own self for holes in your body. I mean, it was just brutal. But you become invested in it. So I like how time, how dirty time makes the viewer invested. So in this particular film, I wanted a big ticket item, like a, like a washing machine or a refrigerator or an automobile coming from scrap to done. But, but then I ended up make filming in this factory that made bowling down supplies. So then after the second, third day, I was trying to figure out what was my sl slightly narration. And then so I started filming objects that look like art objects, so to speak. So, so, so then so I was framing up, and so this, so I was basically framing up objects that look sculptural, whatever. And you know, and then the people working on these kind of like objects, whatever. So it took us three days to film it, actually about two and a half days, and then I just shot a lot of 16 millimeters and made other films in there. So the reason I make so many films, because I go to make one film, but end up making maybe like four or five short films based on that. It's just easy. Yeah, I don't know, for me. But, it, but, but, it, but anyway, I like this kind of slow moving time, you know. The people just doing, you know, the kind of physicality of it, so to speak, you know. And in this, and then in, like in this factory, there's mostly uh, people of African descent, uh, Laotian and Vietnamese. 
So I like the, like the first 10 minutes of the film, it's all in Vietnamese. People are like, where are we? You know, whatever, because they're all going to work, all working together. Um, maybe I think this ends. And, and then, so I was trying to find a, it, like at first I had a, like one worker being my narrator, and then I changed it, and I let me find something else. And, and then so I was just mostly into these kind of objects and what they kind of look like and sound like and stuff that make it look like kind of like the minimalist kind of sculptures, whatever, so, so to speak, yeah. And uh, a lot of this stuff is shot with, remember, people, remember, has anybody ever heard of this thing called the digital Bolex? Ever seen this game? Yeah, I think I, I, we had the first one. And that thing lasted about a, about a day. And so we shot a lot of it with that, and you know, you know in the pocket black magic. And, so anyway, so that's like cartoons. Um, so anyway, so like, I like these like long, long takes, these long shots, whatever, because I think I become invested in it. And, and then I'm really, I'm, I'm, I mean, I like the viewer, but I'm not into the viewer, <laughs> you know? So I got you know, whatever. Because I, I don't know the viewer, like I, but I do know the subject matter, so I make films for the subject matter. So me and the subject matter will talk and hash it out, and then for me, I'm making the film for uh, them. And I maybe, except I'm making a longer film, I maybe, like I know, like at this moment, I sh something sh else should happen, or not, you know, but, but mostly not, whatever. But anyway, so that's like Park Lanes. Um, and this particular film, uh, this is called Tonsil Park, and then again, I like the whole idea. So with this film, is a 10 minute take film, the shot with an ARES. And, 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 he, and, then, and then the sound is in the room, but not in the room. So I was thinking about making something like kind of abstract, kind of like a, because I watch a lot of flicker films, but I don't, but I like, but I like how subject matter can change and stuff. So in this particular film, um, I think it started out like I went, I forgot that there was a primary in Virginia, like in March. I was like, oh shit, is that super? Are we Super Tuesday or whatever? So then I biked to the polling office, my polling spot, and I was like, oh shit, I can make a 13 hour film, Kevin, you know, this is exciting. So I got permission, but, they, but I'm glad I didn't make a 13 hour film. Um, because not that much, which is fine, that much happened. But anyway, but then so, but what I realized that, you know, you know Charlottesville is 20% black, apparently it was 50% black a long time, about 30 years ago, now it's only 20, about, yeah, 40 years ago, now it's 20% black. But, but always, you know, again, if you go to any, I mean, we're in, we're in, we're in, we're in Philadelphia, and I did stuff in Harrisburg before, Charleston, South Carolina, um, no, Charleston, West Virginia, every state, ca if anywhere there's government, there's black folks, because the private sector didn't hire black, only the public sector. And so the whole idea of, if you go to any polling place, it's black people, who have, doc I mean, have, like, um, have democracy has failed, but we still work in, in to keep the, the democracy alive, whatever, so to speak, because we believe in it. Not the ruling class, but they don't believe in it, because, I mean, I've been department head, and I realized that, I mean, I don't know. But white people, they love them men shit. You know, we'll vote on some shit, and then next week, they realize that it doesn't service them, and then they change shit. And I was like, no, we can't do it, we just did this shit. You know, but anyway, so sorry, as I, and that, that's my coming from a department meeting Tuesday. <laughs> I thought we was a cool on this shit. You know, anyway, so like no more votes, you know, whatever. But anyway, so, but anyway, so here I wanted to, um, so, so the limitations of being in this place, um, I couldn't record sound on her because she's giving out names and addresses, can't do that, which is cool. And also I did use a, and it's, I want to use a telephoto lens and so, so again, I like, I mean, although I had a small crew with me here, but I do like making films like a painter. Like, you know, like a, just a painter has the brushes, the easel, the canvas, you know, with the paints. I have the tripod, the lens, the camera, the film stock. So I like to kind of make things like that. So here I wanted to use, I, like I want to flatten out the space and then I want the, the sub, you know, like folks kind of the block our view of this particular, like the per, like the per, just and doing their civil service, so to speak, and then so there's eight of these kind of takes in this particular film, um, and then like the audio was coming from another part of the room, not that part of the room. So I like building up the audio, so to speak, and um, and then also too, um, this is a film about a church, 
uh, about a flood. Um, my family's been from Mississippi. Uh, my mother's side of the family doesn't have a lot of old heirlooms because there was a flood in 1973 that lost everything. So I wanted to make a film about the flood. So what they did, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, they dredged like the Tom Bigby River was doing like this. And then so they dredged it. So they kind of made this fictional island. And so I'm making these long takes films and stuff. So I was like, oh shit, it takes us 10 minutes to get around the island, so one long take. But first we gotta find a black person to water ski. And, and then just like every other sector of America, like my uncles and them, they used to boat and fish and get baptized in the river and shit. And now, the, 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 now money has came into play. Everybody wants riverfront property and the lake is segregated. So the kids that we took out there, first time they've ever been on water, and on, on the Tom Bigby. So like if you're not in your 60s, you didn't go on the Tom Bigby. So again, they segregated the, like the river. So, but anyway, so we got this drummer. <laughs> he could, so we taught him, so we had to hire a water skier instructor to teach him how to water ski. And it was like, kind of nerve wracking because the, the guy didn't talk for about a week and he couldn't walk for a while. But anyway, so I wanted him to water ski all around the thing, whatever. And he just couldn't stay up. And then that was even better, because I can cut out of it, whatever. But, but the reason I'm showing this piece of film, I forgot, I'm talking shit. But yeah, I'm showing the film, it was that I like, it's not about him, but it's about the landscape. So I knew, the, the, how can I film the river without showing the boat, and you know, the boat's playing here. But it's the figure ground relationship that I'm into. I'm into these kind of flat, like kind of formal painterly kind of things like for me it's about the figure no like it's more like it's about the ground more than it's about the figure so this is another way to mark the river you, you know just by having them kind of like the water skate so we do this three times and it's the and then it's the 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 river um um it's the uh, around the island so we eventually go around the island Whatever, so speak. But for me, I mean, of course, the camera's fixation on him, but I want the viewer to look back. I mean, for me, it's mostly, you know, uh, the river. That, so it's more the landscape. So here's another one. I shot this a uh, couple of summers ago um, during the pandemic. And then, so for me, it's, now how do I film the Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C.? Oh, well, I'll just get a, like a roller skater to skate on it. And it was kind of rough. So I'm on rollerblades, which is the first time I've been on rollerblades in like 20 some years. But anyway, so I, like, I was hoping that we would skate around the Black Lives Matter, but it was just too rough. So we only stayed on the I and S of lives. But, I, but again, it's about the landscape and the figures there, you know. So it's how can I film the landscape? But I need a figure or whatever, so to speak. And so it is hard to roll the skater. Um, just get around the plaza, but anyway. So that's, uh, so those are the kind of things I, I look for or whatever. And then also, I have like multiple bodies of work. Um, so I have all these, it's like I said, I'm from Mansfield, Ohio. And we got some weird shit happening in Mansfield, Ohio. Yeah, really weird, yeah. So, um, so this film's called IFO. Um, and it's basically, um, then I have a whole body of work where I'm re-representing things that were E, in the, either in the media that were filmed, that were about, man, or, or people that were filmed, or famous people that were from Mansfield, Ohio. And Mansfield, Ohio had the, oh, I forgot what year it was, but the most credible UFO sighting in the United States, the coin incident. Um, there was some Air National Guard soldiers in a helicopter. Among, uh, um, young uncles didn't know the story. But um, because they were all on board, and this is the most credible UFO, so they chased this cigar-looking thing up in the sky. And the reason why people believe them because they used up a lot of fuel to go up to find this thing. And but my uncle says they're probably in Indianapolis, like in Indianapolis, picking up prostitutes. Yeah, that's another story. But also, but in the film, I have this this black cab driver t talking about his viewing of a UFO sighting. And this whole idea of the oral tradition, like who do we believe? You know, we never really believe the kind of, just African Americans say something's always contentious, or they have to get somebody else to kind of counter it, whatever like that. But uh, we always believe the so-called official thing, whatever that. Yeah, because I remember, um, I don't know, people from South Carolina, but the black people know that this, like, the, what Senator Storm 
Storm Thurman? Yeah, we had, he had black kids. But people were like, no, we don't. No, we don't. And then even at the University of Virginia, they tried to deny Thomas Jefferson and took them 100 years to say, yeah, he fathered some kids. Well, you mean he raped some women? <laughs> you know, but you know, they haven't got past that yet. But the whole idea of the black orders, and nobody pays attention to it. So this film was kind of about that. Um, and this film was about uh, the we have some really police, um, really corrupt police officers, just like in a lot of cities. And so they used to, um, so I don't know if, if any, like people my age, I'm like 50, so people who had driver's ed in the 80s. Did you ever see those films? Um, uh, Signal 30. They used to show this, if you're going to get a, your driver's if you're about my age and you went to get a driver's license, well, they'd show you this film where the people would be in mangled cars on their last breath and somebody would be with a Bolex. Filming them, so like a cop would be filming them, and so and so they ban these things. But they're on, I think they're on the, the YouTube. I have them, but, uh, but 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 anyway, the police was were corrupt and they had film equipment. They did this thing film called the Tea Room, the Glorious Tea Room. Um, but they also made stag films. Uh, I know a guy has them. You got know Rick Perlinger, uh, the, the archive.org, whatever. So me and him are trying to tag team this motherfucker to get some films out of him, but he won't let him see them. But, uh, but the, the police made stag films, so I'm making, so I'm making films based on what people have seen these films, and I haven't seen these films. But also, too, the police caught a black woman um, uh, shoplifting and made her start her own PSA about shoplifting. And he has these films, too, so I've been kind of remaking films through oral tradition to what people say these are on, are on these films. So this is... Uh, one of the films. Um, I don't know if anybody's in the boxing. Um, Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, anyway, um, sports. You guys, you guys are. This is a sport town. Got that. Like Eagles and Phillies are doing well. I think Harden's back practicing, but I don't know what he's doing. But, but anyway, um, the one of the best teams in the United States ever is the 76 Montreal Olympic U.S. boxing team. Had Aaron Pryor, um, had the Spinks brothers, had Sugar Ray, you know, Sugar Ray, you know what Leonard was on this team. And so he was a famous glory boy. And at the time, when they turned pro after the, six, the 76 games, they were criticizing um, Sugar Ray uh, fighting white and light. He was fighting, his first fights were these kind of white uh, fighters and, and then like he was pummeling them. So there's this guy from my hometown, um, Art McKnight. He's he really from Cleveland, but he went to jail at, at the OSR and he learned boxing there and he stayed in my hometown and learned to box more. So he had just fought Aaron Pryor a month ago and then so they got Sugar Ray to fight this guy. Thought Sugar Ray was going to beat him, but so then when I was researched, so I got a hold of Art McKnight. I haven't heard him. I used to shoot dice with him. I mean, he was a rough guy back in the day. He was a questionable figure back, but now he's older. But now, but, I, but it's funny cause I, because he said, man, you're never going to find that fight. Because in the fight, he cut Sugar Ray, or Sugar Ray was cut. And I went to, to the London borough of ABC, the Berlin borough of a, a bond in ABC, and nobody has that tape of sh that fight. So then, so then we had to recreate it with Art McKnight's, like, the memory. And my uncle's number, it was, uh, like, the, the fight was in Dayton. So my uncle's number down there, they were all drunk and shit, but they called the fight in the seventh round, and then there was a mini riot. And I do remember an image of Art McKnight on the ropes, s they saying that I'm not hurt, whatever like that. So talking to Art McKnight, I was, like, trying to prompt him. So man, it, it, you know, crazy down there. And then he always kept saying the right man won the fight, even though he protested it. So instead of him protesting, I had a, so I made these ring cards and if you go to a fight, you have a ring girl walking around. So I had the ring, I, well, this is um, a friend of mine. She did the sound and uh, with it, um, my partner, with the with the heck she's in it, she did the sound and she, and as I had her hold to sign up like a protest. So I made her protest for him. And then so we hired this uh, Golden Glove boxer 
to reenact the fight like by himself. So, you know, they, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, so to speak. So then I was kind of playing with the heart of how do I make this kind of, because Art didn't want to say he protested the end of the fight, although he did. So he, you know, but then, but then I had the ring girl walk around and back in my hometown, like the parks, uh, basketball is the king sport. So all the black, um, so I'm from King Street, which there's a park, there's a basketball court there. There's a John Todd, John Park. So uh, we went to eight of the parks, whatever, and then it had her kind of use the, the sign as a protest, whatever. So that was one film from Mansfield. Um, real quick, you know, my uncle was in a you know, gospel group, and you know, I, I tell my family I'm an artist, and they're like, oh, okay, 20 years, 30 years later, you know I was in a gospel group. Where's that record? <laughs> you know? So then we found the record, so this film's about the famous brown, you know, uh, like the brown singers that are from my hometown. And um, this is a, a sound is um, film piece where I'm filming um, on the right, the right side of the frame. If it's a super 16 frame and the right side of the frame, then the, the high contrast film will make a soundtrack within the frame, so you make noise. So banging on the bars of rhythm is part of the script of, um, of um, Air Force One. So the film is just the, the visuals making the noise based on that. And this is a new film I just did. Um, there was a theater, there was a drive-in film theater that only showed black exploitation films when I was growing up. So this is a film based on that, yeah, based on that. And also too, I make objects and props. I'm still do, like I still do kind of sculptural things. Um, I made a film about a funeral home, employees, and then like I made the funerary headrest for that. Um, this is the billboard that, that was in the film uh, Erie. Um, I did book a billboard for three weeks in Angola, New York, and nobody said anything. This drove right. It was like next to a McDonald's billboard, and people just driving by. But uh, but it's a fictional image because that is my uncle in Germany, and in then um, when he was in the army, and then, and then he just happened to be chilling next to a, like a Volkswagen. So we made this kind of fictitious Volkswagen ad that that there was a factory in. It in Ohio, because in the South, what they would have billboards of uh, factories for people to kind of to come up to work in the South, whatever. Um, I made a film about, does anybody know scrappers? Do, do, do people scrap here? And of course they do. <laughs> yeah, well anyway, I, just, I hired these actors that were in a film of mine to act like they're stealing manhole covers, but then, uh, but then film had become a documentary, and, I, and I'm not gonna tell you how. Shit got real fast, uh, like really fast. <laughs> I was like, did y'all go back to that? Uh, but, it, uh, but anyway, I made the tools to, uh, because I want to, because I, I make things that work so I can get the kind of physical feel of the thing so I know what the actor's going to be doing. Um, uh, this is at Iowa St. Matthews. I made a bell for the church. Um, they couldn't get the bell to work, so I made a bell for the church. And the bell is wrong. There's different ways to ring the bell um, for like a funeral, for a birth, for services and stuff like that. So we ring them for that. Um, and then also I make these binoculars that are made so every time I go to a different state and there's some, with some uh, like the kin folks, I'm always uh, filming people watching birds. I like people to look up, you know. I'm like, so, you know, because these are all for, you know, various states. Um, so, you know, I'm into, you know, like, you know, um, my production company's named Trilobite Arts, and, and then, like, the Trilobite is the state fossil of Ohio, and who the hell, well, first of all, the settler mentality to have a state, and then another <laughs> mentality is to dig deep and think that we discovered the Trilobite, <laughs> the trilobite is, is something that's Ohioan. But also, you know, like the cactus wren is Arizona, and you know, so this whole idea of like not, you know, of, you know, of not staring at the land but staring upward, you know, so to speak. So, I've, so I made a bunch of films with this summer. So I just take my binoculars, um, and and so now I make props that don't work anymore, um, so to speak. Um, uh, here's I made these, and then oh, and those binoculars were made at the Western House factory that I used to work in during World War II. And then also where they made these irons, so these irons are made out of rubber so they don't kind of function. And then that function, that's a, um, a meat tenderizer that was made in my hometown. 
And I just, and, and so now I'm making objects that are not in films, but this is a cast tire. Um, and I just found out my uncle worked, quit school at 13 to make a railroad, no, my grandfather quit school at 13 to make a railroad tie, so I had to cast a railroad tie. I'm still injured from that, uh, the adrenaline, that thing was heavy. So that's, uh, so I'd make a mold and cast rubber, and then I just made these yesterday. Ohio bricks, yeah, yeah. So I'm making a film based on these bricks, whatever, so to speak, and it's cast rubber. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so I have a practice of archive film, uh, film footage as well, and uh, I'm gonna show this uh, scene from this particular film, and then I'm gonna talk about these films me and my colleague makes. But I like making, so I use like archive footage um, as it's, it intentionally used, like if it's a news media thing, I kind of keep it newsy, so to speak. But also too, I have people reenact scenes, so sometimes the photograph from archive, or the audio tape, or if the picture becomes a script, whatever. In this particular film, it's called Emergency Needs, and it's based on, um, I think I got a commission from the Rotterdam Film Festival to make a film about, a film based on Gus Van Sant, the American filmmaker. Um, he made three films, that people know what happened, but didn't know what happened. One of them is Elephant. It's about the Columbine shooting. So we know what happened, but we don't know what happened. And the other one is Last Days about Kurt Cobain. And the other one's about Jerry, about two guys walking in the desert. And so I was trying to think of that concept, and I was thinking about there's something that happened in Cleveland, Ohio, called the Cleveland Shootout, AKA the Glenville Uprising. And it's the, one of the only uprisings where more cops died than blacks. So it happened on the east side. And then the cops were driving around Cleveland trying to get the numbers up. So they're indiscriminately shooting at people. Um, so at the time, in 1966, there was the Huff Riots, which is, a, and then the 67 election, Cleveland was the first city to elect the black, first metropolitan city to elect the black mayor, Carl Lee Stokes. And so on the strength of that election, they figured there would be no more uprisings. But then there was this uprising in 68. Because Cleveland was the only city not to burn down when King was shot, murdered. And then it burned in the summer during the Cleveland shootout. And then, and then I used uh, clips from Bacall Ruby Stokes. And he's such a cool com. He's cooler than Obama before Obama, right? But he's dealing with this hot style press. So I liked his performance, so I had this actor uh, redo his performance. I'm going to show a couple of, a uh, few minutes. Uh, I believe that the crisis and my camera has died right at the beginning. However, there's still cause anyway. to be concerned. I base this on conferences all day here at City Hall and out in the city with National Guard officers, police officials, city councilmen, representatives of the Negro community, and other people. As I make this judgment, I wish to pay tribute to both. So and my strategy was, if you, if you see the performance, then it'll strip away the politics, but it doesn't do that. But it was like a formal attempt. It was all based on a Robert Rauschenberg painting. Both them one and two. So it's two paintings right next to each other, and then you, and then you compare. I them believe that the crisis has passed. However, there is still cause to be concerned. Now, I base this on conferences all day here at City Hall and out in the city, with National Guard officers, police officials, city councilmen, representatives of the Negro community, and other people. As I make this judgment, I wish to pay tribute to both the great desire of the Negro community that order be restored and the ability and effectiveness of the Cleveland Police and National Guardsmen operating under trying and somewhat unique circumstances. Now, we must, however, remain prepared to meet special circumstances that could arise following this period of high tension. Well, there, there 
always has been very, a very great, great difficulty, difficulty in, in helping, helping people, people to understand, understand what, what have, have been, been and ordinarily are the, ordinarily are the uh, uh, basic causes, basic of, riots. causes of riots. Ordinarily, ordinarily the, the rioting, rioting as we have known it, the civil disorders as we have known it, has been the frustrated, frustrated rebellion, rebellion or, or reaction, reaction of, a, uh, of, a, uh, of a deprived population, of a deprived population to an unresponsive, to city, an government, unresponsive ordinarily. city government. Ordinarily. Now, that was now, not reflected, this in, was last not reflected in last night's incident. incident. And, it and it would have, have to, to be, be, at least at, least at this, this point, point last, last night's, night's incident, incident would still have to be viewed in the light of the... Of the uh, uh, of, of the, the small, small and determined, and group, determined group that were that involved. Were involved. That's what a great answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> what did their motive? What did they want? Well, well, I can't guess at their at their motive, but we can only we can only draw the conclusion from the the fact that they were armed and were they unhappy about the fact that they were armed and do you have any idea what they were unhappy about? Well, well, nothing that I could report to you at all. Do you think this is some sort of nationwide black nationalist plot, perhaps, that didn't come off to the full extent that it was planned? Well, I, I would have no facts with which. What, what, what was the motive that you saw? Is there any order on the shooting? That was a great part. Because at uh, the riot before, um, there were any order for the, for the shooting shooters. Shooters. Well, you'll have to talk with General uh, Del Corso about that because. Under the statute, when the guards are called in, the uh, uh, the chief executive of the of the, of the uh, government involved, and then, then is, I like how uh, he's like thinking about what he's saying in general what his uh, wish is for the guard, but it specifically states in the statute that the mode and means of carrying it out are the prerogative of the guard itself. I have uh, uh, requested, requested that there be no uh, looting. That there be no looting. People go home. People go home. Similarly, Similarly, I place, I place my own personal, uh, my own premiums, personal upon premiums upon life, life as, having uh, as having a priority to property. To property. So that's a, something that you don't hear from like the the ruling class. But on the strength of those kind of found footage films, um, I have a colleague at the University of Virginia, Claude and Harold. She's She's, I think she's the smartest person there, right? Yeah, what did you she's like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not even close. But anyway, so she's at American Studies. And she went to Temple here, and she admits it now, but she's in the Temple Hall of Fame for basketball. She graduated in three years and got her PhD. Brilliant. But, 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 uh, but anyway, but she was digging in the archives, uh, the, the history of blacks at the University of Virginia. It was just like these Ivy League schools. They let in, I don't know. They let women in 71, that's Yale. They let, when did this campus become co-ed? Uh, well, there was a so there's always been females going to Penn? Well, going to the fire department. I don't think a century. <laughs> oh, 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 really? Oh, oh, okay, because I know all the, you know, the Harvard and the Yale, it was 1971, and so was the University of Virginia. Yeah, and then even, Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. But, and then the University of Virginia was 1971 and stuff, so we got this history of it. So she was doing all this research and she found these photographs um, uh, in the archives, and I love this picture because it's the only image of African Americans playing foosball since 19, <laughs> since, no, but since 1839. But anyway, yeah. So anyway, but, but that's Vivian Gordon, you started the African Americans pro program, this is my late, Colleague Julian Bond, anybody knows about civil rights activism? Yeah, he used to teach with us. Uh, I remember I went to his retirement party and then Harold Belafonte came out and I was like, <laughs> you know, and, and they look gorgeous, but, you, but I think you can tell they're older because they move slow, but God damn, they look good. But anyway, so anyway, so, so, uh, so, well, so anyway, so I thought Claudine had found all these, these stacks of films. I thought, oh shit, like somebody made a film here. It was like, and, but then it was like old films that didn't get taken because back in the day it could be rent films from the library and they just didn't send them back, whatever. So we said, well, hell, we'll, we'll make a film as if somebody found a documentary about like the Vivian Gordon. So we, you know, this is the foosball scene. So anyway, so, you know, well, we basically have a Vivian Gordon speech on top of the, the images, but the photographs are our script. 
So we use um, like the cocktail party, and then, and then I shot it in a certain way. And then that's where Aaron, um, Aaron Stewart, she's a, like an actress, she's in a couple of my films. So she plays like Vivian Gordon. And then I, and then so we said cast by afros and, and stuff like that. And, and there was a little like, when the essay shot, he just wrote that show Jury Duty on Amazon. I think he wrote episode two, I think, yeah. He went to Lower Merrimack for our grad school or whatever. But anyway, so the only way, so, so here's the kind of films that we were making. So we were making films about the history of African Americans and this particular film, we wanted to make a film as if somebody found parts of a narrative film um, about, oh fuck, I can't remember his name now. Um, he's a state rep here. Um, oh shit, I can't think of his name, but he, but he was the first black PhD student and he was president of the student council. And he basically um, took, uh, well, there was a story that him and President Edgar Shannon, who was a progressive president of the university, and, and then they t took a note to, because after the, the Kent State shootings, they took, the, they took a note to Congress to protest the Vietnam War, but they went in separate cars. So we have them doing, so we made this kind of fictional road movie with rear prayer ejection to make it, as if somebody found the narrative film. Um, we did a, found the first uh, African American Scholarship athletes made a film based on them by using it, like real athletes, like uh, in uh, period piece clothing. Um, there's a great story that um, Sly and the Family Stone came to the university, and Sly was upset because they put him in this. The your students picked him up and they put him in a tiny car, so we reenacted that off in the airport uh, scene. But then we found out afterwards that Sly would send a stunt Sly because he always gets fine, fine, fine for being in late all the time, yeah. So anyway, so we just heard that story. Um, there was an area on campus students named the Black Bus Stop, so we made this fic uh, um, um, magical realism step show uh, for us. We had all the black fraternities and sororities do their dances, and then we hired a choreographer for it too as well, the Black Bus Stop. Um, there is a black uh, gospel choir called Black Voices, and we, in, in Claudrina's class, she teaches students to go back to, to the archives to find older uh, alumni, and we had some older uh, folks who graduated said that they drove to Hampton to uh, give a you know, gospel concert, so we did this kind of magical realism that the bus driver was singing her song, who, who was a sculptor and an actor and then a singer. Um, and so we made this kind of magical realism kind of song to get them to safety, whatever, back on the bus. Um, there was a black press, um, so we uh, shot a film based on the newspaper that they made. And uh, this film, like Gospel Hill, it's based on um, uh, black hospital employees. There was a speakeasy south of town where they used to gather. So we, so um, has anybody seen, um, the film called The Mac, it's a black exploitation film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was a great scene where uh, Max Julian and the great, the, the Richard Pryor are talking in a bar. So we just took out the pimp stuff and added hospital employee work you know, to it, so to speak. Um, and then this is one of the newest ones. Um, we found the black, well, the first black woman scholastic athlete. She played field hockey. So at the time, oh, and the Barnett twins, they're from here. Fred Barnett is their dad, he's a wide receiver for the Eagles. Um, one of them played uh, lacrosse and, uh, and the other one was uh, like a rower. So we just filmed them. And then we had the voiceover of the first black scholastic athlete talk over it. And this is our new one. Um, it's based on this photograph. Uh, of this couple, or we shot it, but we haven't cut it yet, waiting on the music. So we're gonna have the same couple dressed in 70s clothes, dressed in 80s clothes, and then walk into a 90s house party and doing the kid and play dance and like that. So we shot that, but we just haven't finished it yet, so that's a new one. So, and then also, I, real quick, I do projection films as well in, uh, in the galleries, but, but but if I design a film for the gallery, I know a lot of films of mine are now Park Lane's plays and galleries now, but I always like the subject matter to dictate 
the condition of the room, like make it darker. So this film is 93, so my daughter's great-great-grandfather, he blows out exactly 93 candles and make the, the room darker. Um, I'm a, like a moon whore, I love the moon. And so I rigged up my camera. I mean, I was supposed to make this film about the University of Virginia. I was like, fuck all this shit. So then I used, I th for the art museum, and then I used the telescope to make art with. So, so I rigged up my RES to the UVA t telescope. So in this one, it goes from moon to space, and this goes from light to dark, yeah. So, so it creates the, you know, so it's a, like a 10 minute long take and then the camera doesn't move. And so Planet Earth moves, so it's kind of tough to make films when Planet Earth moves. And then now I do these, uh, and now I follow the eclipse. So I'm already crewing up for April 8th next year. Um, I'm gonna shoot the April 8th uh, eclipse in Cleveland, Carbondale, and Mexico in three time zones. Um, so anyway, so these are these kind of biggest, big, big, big installations. And then I shot a film at the, um, at the um, uh, canal, uh, the Panama uh, Canal, and the doors closed and open to make uh, the darker, oh, with the uh, gallery light and dark. And now I make these installations now based on sound. So I have one image on the back and one on the front, and then but the audio makes the, the land, um, the soundscape, uh, both of them two together, and I don't know if anybody knows um, Eddie Hazel, the guitarist for the Funkadelic. Have you heard of Maggot Brain? Yeah. Well, there's a 10 minute solo, which is a, that a, um, it's all based on uh, George Clinton. Uh, well, I always thought the story was George Clinton told Eddie Hazel that his mama died and then go play the solo. But apparently he said, play as if your mama died. But I like the first narrative because I like the fact that he went in there and rocked out and then art was resurrection. So I always want art to be a resurrector, so to speak. So that's what I went with. So on one wall, oh yeah, this was down in Florence. Yeah, this was it. Yeah, so on, so on one wall is the melody and, and then on the other wall is him playing the solo and then it encapsulates the, um, what the soundtrack is all over. I think so, right, Justin? Yeah. Okay, all right. I was checking because I didn't see it. <laughs> so, and then also, too, um, I've got a series of films where I'm crushing cars. Everywhere I go to a new town, I ask them if I can crush some General Motors cars. Because the General Motors plant in my hometown was a stamping plant, so they made door panels, side panels, roofs, no, trunks, and, and, and hood panels. So I always try to film GM cars being crushed. Um, yeah, yeah, and then the last slide, I think, yeah, the, the last slide, my friend Dominic Brown just passed away, and here's us, we were photographing and filming the largest prison uprising in history of the United States was in Lucasville, Ohio, and we got down there for the last couple of days, and I like to show this image because, you know, you can't do this art alone, so you got to form your own community, you know, you know, um, you know, your family, your friends are helping you, and you can't do art by yourself. So I'm always, so I've done all this stuff, but I bring people along with me by teaching, and also too, just by, you know, people help me, so I help them, so to speak. So, you know, we, we, we always used to do these performances and projects to together, so I like to tell people that you can't do this alone. So, so that's it, thanks. Right on, right, right on. Oh, I'm talking to you guys. Any uh, comments and questions? Anybody? Uh, all right, you may try to say. Anybody? Uh, anybody? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. That was my favorite uh, artist lecture. I wasn't thinking. Oh, I could have <laughs> I mean, pulled off my shirt and said I got shot. <laughs> <laughs> What? What kind of middle school, what kind of art school you had at 13? Oh, oh. But yeah, no, this is, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thanks. We're right on. Is there a question in there? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Hey, like, get anybody else? Oh, we got a young man back there. Oh, everybody's young to me, so. Uh, a young man back there. Geezer. 
Kevin, thank you for uh, sharing all of this with us. It's yeah. um, super nostalgic for me personally because um, uh, my family's from Mansfield, Ohio. What? And, uh, what part? Well, my father actually grew up with your brother. Um, his name is... <laughs> <laughs> no, what's your last name? Waddell. Shit, you're yeah. going to Waddell, yeah. Because oh, mm -hmm. they lived off of Chester, I think, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Uh, the, the movie looked familiar. I thought maybe you might have been at Black Star or something. I was at Black Star, too. Oh, but, shit. Man, you um, got to come up to it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to come up out of motherfucker from Mansfield. But, uh, Sorry, yeah, but this was super nostalgic because, okay. like, you know, I grew up going to Johns Park and North Lake yeah, Park yeah, and yeah, yeah. all the Mansfield places and whatnot. And uh, for me personally, location is really important for my work. And mm -hmm. I see you mentioning, like, you know, the, the Mason isn't lying is at the Canadian border. Yeah. You're talking about the economy of... Um, the South, I live down South as well, so I also know what it's like to come back up North and see more Confederate flags in some of the neighborhoods that I was in, South yeah. Carolina. Um, and so I'm curious to know, um, why is location so important in the work that you make? Well, I mean, that's a good question, because I always think, you know, because it shapes you, informs you. I mean, do you, I mean, you know, it's interesting, because I live in the hills now, and then so, you know, if, if, you, know, if you go to Cleveland, Ohio, like more accidents aren't by you know, you know aren't by snow or wet leaves or weather. It's all it's sun glare because you're driving west and the sun hits you and then everybody's like bump bumping each other and you know, stuff. So I don't get the sun glare in uh, mid Virginia. So I always like how landscape you know is is, is informs you and different. And then because I think you're a product of your landscape, you're a product of it. Um, your language, how people speak. There's certain like, like I remember going to Mississippi with my aunt, and I remember we were getting the whole hotel rooms. We had a family reunion in Columbus, Mississippi, and I just remember um, uh, my aunt being take being taken aback because she speaks, and I have a speech impediment. And I talk fast, and it's a Eastern Alabama Mississippian speak, and I have to slow down. I had to go to speech therapy when I was young, and um, and. Then, but she realized that the kids that were waiting on us, they went to sit, like segregated schools. So that language that she has is gone because they integrated. So they didn't have that kind of thing. So I like these kind of, you know, because I always say there's like, there's 49 million black Americans. You know, there's more black Americans than there are Canadians. But why can't we be diverse? You know, like, you know so I like a cat from St. Louis is not going to act the way a cat from Florida. You know, or a cat from Tulsa is not going to act the way a cat from, like, um, from Southside Chicago. You know, so they have these kind of, you know, so I like to kind of talk to people and what people do and, you know, and what's going on. And for some reason or another in Mansfield, I mean, I mean, just when I showed parts of company line, you know, people knew, and then here's how I get it from. I know what time shit happened, not just the date and year. Oh, that was 517. You know, and people knew what time they came up there, so it was interesting how people knew that. And then I guess because, you know, the clock is labor, so people know the clock. Um, the clock is complete, I mean, I never see the clock as, oh, I took a half an hour nap. No, um, I didn't work for a half an hour, you know. So I'm used to this clock being this labor thing. So that's, and then that's the product of being from that particular environment. So I, that. So I always tell students, like, think about where they're from and stuff, because it's fascinating. I, I think it's interesting where people are from, so to speak, or, you know. And then I think it's important, I mean, especially for black Americans, too, as well, because there's always movement and migration and stuff like that. And it's, and it's an interesting story. It's just an interesting part of history, whatever. And then, so we're still in history. We're still, uh, so I treat everything like that IFO film. I treat it as historic. Like this guy saw a flying saucer. Shit, that's historic. I'm mean, having other motherfuckers flying signs. I thought, I saw a flying saucer. Yeah, eh, three of us. <laughs> uh oh, four. <laughs> we're coming out of the closet slowly. <laughs> you know, but then, you know, the whole idea of like oral tradition, stories, so landscapes. But it's interesting, but in some of the films, it doesn't mention it, but it's just there. So that, that's the whole idea of like not, so that's the kind of poo blackism where <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I don't give them the front, you know, like this. Yeah, I don't give the viewer what the setup. They are there at act two, so to speak. Yeah, but oh yeah, but I heard you're doing film. All right, man, we got to talk. Shit, uh, it's good to have somebody from. I feel, I like feel empowered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chester Avenue.
Um, yeah, that church is still there. The Jordan church is still there. I think his son died or somebody just died recently. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, I enjoyed this a lot. This was really great. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and I, I usually work in digital. And I think for me, it's like I'm trying to decrease the amount of impediments that it takes for me to capture a certain moment. Now, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> like, if I see something happening, I can grab my camera, and I can, I can just go out there and film it. I don't have to set up too much. Well, I got my Super 8 camera here, so that's not that. Right. But you still <laughs> have to deal with the, the loading, if you're out of film, and the time that you have left on that reel, and, like, well, hey, and yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, that's just excuses. Okay. okay. <laughs> it might be. It might be. But I'm interested in what's the significance to you yeah. of shooting 16 millimeter versus that, um, digital or 8 or 35. Yeah, um, it depends like on the content. Um, yeah, I think all, you know, I come from sculpture, and um, my old professors at University of Akron, when University of Akron is an undergraduate, they all came out of that Iowa, that good Iowa school. They went to school with um, Charles Ray and Anna Medetta. And then in the 70s, I went to school in the 80s, but in the 70s it was all about, like, not quite like the minimalist sculpture, but art, excuse me, art had to project its, what materials, procedures, and process, you know, had to project what it was made out of. And I'd like the physics, so I like how the objects and uh, what the materiality is language. And for me, film is basically, I like the cameras better. Like there hasn't been an HD camera that I can get down with. Like except for this old school Sony mini DV one chip camera. I made three features with that camera. Um, Cause at the time the audio on that thing was a DAT audio. So I go back to the core definition of these things. Like if I want to record something, if, if, if I think the subject matter need to be recorded, then I'll use HD or, or mini D, or just mostly like, like, like my Ursas or my Black Magics. But if I want to expose something, expose the viewer to something, expose me to something, then I'll expose film. Then I'll have the silver highlight crystals work kind of what reacting to the light, whatever. Um, so, that's, so that's how I look at this. Because in my sketchbook, I'll have like HD, question mark, um, and because I like what the materials do, like I like the lim I, I like that I have to load it up. I like that it has a maximum of 11 minutes, or the Super 8 has it has a three minute take, and what can happen with those limitations and stuff like that. You know, your canvas when you paint, it's like you know, uh, I don't know, four by six, whatever. So you know, you've got the frame, the limitations. So I like these things do these things, whatever, so to speak. You know, um, yeah, yeah, I'm. For some reason, I'm keep. It's got to be exposed or something. Just like I'm exposed. It's just like I'm exposing Mansfield, Ohio, to people, so to speak. You know, as opposed to recording. But um, every now and then, I have to be at somebody's job site. Then I have to work fast. You know, I can't get in the way. Well, then I'll use HD equipment like that. But now I've used f fast speed films, and I'll scout the place out. But but yeah. But for me, it's about the, like for me, it's about the cameras and what the materiality, whatever, in the con and, and then, then for me, it's part of the content, you know, the grain, you know, all, like all that stuff is part of the content, whatever, you know, you see those, um, what, um, what the, the paintings upstairs, and I knew that person was from Yale, because they're all doing figurative painting at Yale, and <laughs> so I was right about that. I'm a guy who likes to be right all the time, no, I, no, I was kidding, <laughs> and, but also, I knew he was painting on board, because canvas has that push, and somehow or another has that, because he was taking them, because I knew, because just by looking at, the, at these cool images, I knew they're taken from photographs because they're flat. And then he chose to paint them on board, make it even flatter. So that's, so all these things add to the content of the piece. And for me, the time of these things, you know, like the camera and the lens is very important too as well. It adds to the content of the piece, whatever, so to speak. So it's the same kind of thing. So, so it depends on what it, so it depends on what the subject matter of the film is going to be. But, and then, so now I'm using this high contrast film. So the faces are almost like a Kerry James Marshall, or they're almost, like almost just jet black. So I'm all about that and stuff too as well. So, yeah. yeah. Is, any, is anybody, anybody? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thanks.
for the talk. Um, yeah, right on. I, I guess I, I'm going back to something you said at the very beginning of the talk about um, like kind of skipping act one oh, yeah. and you know kind of jumping right in mm -hmm. and it just has sort of s stuck with me during uh, the presentation and I guess it made me think about the way that you know I think sometimes a, uh, a difficulty or a kind of a complaint that that people don't, that might not spend a lot of time looking at contemporary art might articulate about it is like that the self-referentiality oh, I, lo is, is I love like that shit. Can be, <laughs> <laughs> just to say, no, but, that, yeah. but just to say that yeah. that can sometimes be alienating if you're, if you're not oriented around the references. Yeah. But, it, but the way that your film kind of drops into these moments in people's lives where obviously they're also communicating in a really like yeah, yeah, self-referential yeah. way that we all are when, mm -hmm. we're, when we share language or, you know, yeah. references. And I guess I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about kind of the yeah. relationship between those kind of moments and yeah, I mean, interest in art. I mean, for me, I mean, you know, like I learned about Christianity in art history class. I'm like, who's the guy on the cross? And people yeah. looking at me. Like, I didn't know who that motherfucker was, but apparently he did something. <laughs> and, and People are taking some claw. I mean, so I had to figure out who he was and who's carrying the stick, who's got the animals with him, you know, which Mary is what, so I can get through art history class, not because of Christianity. So when people were painting Christianity, if you're not on board with that shit, well, then you're not on board. So, you know, so for me, but I like the fact that I like abstract expression, you know, like post toasties, post office art, I don't know what I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, you know, I like the fact that the work can be self-referential, you know, and I mean, that's all I got is me, right? So, so, but then also too, it's not just about me, but it's about within this frame of the, so I like that those auto employees are talking about auto and it's, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what the buy-in is. I don't know anything. But, but I like them talking about, because they're smarter than us. They know the shit, you know, they know what the unions are doing good, they know that management sucks, and, and, there's, and, and, and they're articulating it in their way, not to us. And, then, and so I like, and then so people may not get down with, with that, but I make work for the subject matter. I like, I think they're intellectuals, I think they're brilliant, and let's go with that. The, you know, so so that may be self-referential, but, and I remember I used to make, I remember I had that drag r race in film. I remember people were upset because I didn't make a film about the history of black folks drag racing. I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do it. Do it yourself. <laughs> this family is, they're brilliant. They're the most smartest people I've met in their life. And they're breaking down what happens on a drag racing track. And that's something, if you can't get down with that, well then you can't get down with, with um, intellectualizing, because that's what they're intellect. So it may be, so I like how it's self-referential like that, whatever. Like, I mean, there's scenes in Park Lanes, and I'm from, and I, well, I've been in Virginia for 20 years, and at lunch, I can't understand these guys, because they're speaking Virginia ease. It's in there. And then the first part of that film is in Vietnamese. It's in there. You know, it's into itself, whatever. It's self -re You know, it's like a Frank Stella painting. It just, re re it, you know, it kind of references itself. And that, I like that as a formal quality, whatever. And that's what the materials, too, as well. It just self-contained like that. Uh, so, but that's how I get down, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, if it's hostile to the audience, it's hostile to the audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh, people, uh-oh, 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 hands are going up. Sorry about <laughs> that. Um, yeah. I first saw your work in a gallery installation, and since then I've seen it in galleries and theaters, but the most time I've spent with your work has been in bed on my computer. Uh, oh, that's, and that's creepy. Well, <laughs> but in a good way. It's a, I watch, I, I <laughs> sat and watched all of Park Lanes. And hey, man, get down now, you get down. You know. And I, I guess <laughs> the, the first yeah. part is like, what is the difference between a gallery movie and a screening movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, is that third space of a private movie? Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, uh, the caption happened? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh. Okay. What did it do? Oh, all the cuss words like? Kevin colon creepy. Oh. <laughs> all right. Like all the cuss words are coming up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, like what is that material difference <laughs> between a gallery, uh, a theater, and then, you know, the other spaces that a movie can live in? Yeah, I mean, 
damn. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I do it in the making. Um, it's not in the view. I mean, I know folks because I know Criterion. I got to deal with Criterion, so they're showing stuff and. I don't know. Uh, I mean, Park Lane's back in the day was designed for be a, to be a physical DVD box set, like eight DVDs of each hour, and it was supposed to sit underneath your tape, your um, your like entertainment center. That's what they, yeah, like that. So, I, so like that was how it was designed back in the day, and um, but then people don't have DVDs no more, like I said. But um, so I guess. And then I remember shooting it. I remember the first hour I was talking to Khalil. I was like, Khalil right there. I was like, oh no, man, this has got to go in the theater. You know, if for some reason or another, because I was wanting it to be in like, because I think it was, I think I was, com no, that fell apart. But it was supposed to play in a, like a gallery for eight hours. So I'd be part, you know, whatever. But then I said, like, oh no, this thing, it, it's got to go in the movie theater. And I said that the first, the first like two hours of shooting. And I can't remember, because maybe I was looking to the view, find here, oh, and I was thinking maybe this is cinema-esque as opposed to information. Somehow or another, you know, you look at it on the phone, it feels like it's information, I guess, whatever. So I'm, so I don't think about that in the shooting. I, mean, I do think about, like, things making light or, or doing color, and then this thing is for installation, but this thing, yeah, I do think about that. But as for the things on your phone and your, Computer, I can't. I mean, I'd be like, I mean, I did make a YouTube film years ago. It was basically just based on pe people getting their blood pressure checked because it was informational. But, but yeah, but I mean, I mean, that's. F I mean, if, I mean, I'm. I mean, I don't think people are watching this shit, but people are watching it. Okay. So, uh, so like, apparently, I guess, but during the big snowstorm when it was on Cry a Tyranny, there was all this stuff like. You know, we're snowed in, but we watch Park Lanes. I was like, man, y'all really snowed in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because y'all got nothing that was going on up in there. And these are New Yorkans. Yeah, and they're weird anyway, so. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. But it, yeah, that's something I just can't, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, it's going to happen. But I, but I do like, boy, I was watching the, um, the Chilean film, the Chilean, the um, El Condo or something. Um, like, in my bed, <laughs> too as well, and 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 then I did write some notes down. Oh, like this is flat, and I like it. So I may think about like making things even flatter, or whatever, you know. So that's a kind of a formal thing that I thought that was going on or something. Um, there's no, there's not, there was not that much depth to it, in, like on my computer. But I don't know. I may think about something. Yeah, but that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. You said, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hello. That's all formal in here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm just nervous because I have a mic, so that's why I said hello. No, that's all right. <laughs> um, I don't have a question. It's more of a, a comment, and I would love for you to respond, but you don't have to. Well, then that's a question. <laughs> Is it? Uh, um, let's okay, let's see what happens. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> anyway, um, I, I guess I'm kind of making a comparison almost because I just finished reading Jazz by Toni Morrison. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Just one of the top, top artists this country's ever produced. Yeah. And um, Jazz was really hard to get through because no. it does skip to act two. But then what it does is just I was immersed into such a rich world. Yeah. And that's what I'm feeling from your clips what I'm hearing is dialogue that I don't understand because yeah. I don't have access or I'm not a part of this world mm -hmm. but it I feel like it just when you when you when you don't cater to the audience it it asks us to be patient yeah, yeah and yeah, um, that's a good yeah. I just think that's so lovely and I, I love being a, like a part of that experience, um, yeah. Yeah, and for me, I just remember, um, you know, hearing, you know, just hearing those funkadelic like albums. Like, what's George Clinton getting at? You know, you had to kind of put it all. I, mean, I think you, the, 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 the listener, had to put it together. And I don't make it too harsh, 
I, mean, I just like a cat doing some ill shit, and, and that's awesome. And it's got its own language and its own form. Then, you, then you, you just got to get down with it. Because I think everything has complexity, you know. I mean, my dad, he, I mean, I don't, I don't know what, I mean, 11th grade education, 10th grade. But he became the foremost Volvo mechanic in the Midwest. And then through practice and repetition, you can be good at something like that. But then also you can intellectualize something like that too. And then everything has its own language and stuff. And, and I don't need everything explained to me. I should, because I, I make a lot of mistakes in sculpture. I was like, wait, wait I can just do this. Like, oh man, I just blew like $600 on rubber. But, uh, uh, um, but you know, but I do like the kind of the forms and all these art things have its own language. And, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create this, I don't know. I don't know what I'm, uh, I know what I'm doing. Like, uh, like I'm in for the long game. I mean, you know, I'm making this, I make a joke that that all the males in my family die at 74, so I got, so I got a countdown. And it's kind of nice. And I was like, okay, damn, I fucked up this year, but I got to step it up. Because <laughs> this shit's coming to an end, right? But then also, too, but I'm in a little, like, I'm trying to get to all this representation. I'm like, I'm trying to get to pure abstraction. And it seems like every, in the flatness of the visuals, with the knowing, with the materiality, um, making things long, short, drag out. You know, it's all about trying to get to this, like, how can I get to this kind of form? And I think, it, you know, I make a lot, I don't really make a lot of films because I got a, a lot of the same shit. You know, there's a lot of cars going around the Olympic Stadium in, in Berlin, but I'm looking for, like, they're all important and they're doing something slightly different that'll get me to another thing. So, but, but then for me, I'm patient in what it's doing, and I don't know if the viewer is patient or not, but, but I don't really care. But the subject matter is patient with me, just what I'm filming. Like, I just filmed this guy, you know, talking about, um, you know, I work for the telephone company, because it's all based on, you know, Diane Feinstein just passed away, and I got commissioned to make a film about, you know, this show about monuments, people taking down monuments like that. But the original monument taker is a guy named Richard Bradley, who climbed a pole, climbed the flagpole at City Hall in San Francisco to take down the Confederate flag three times. Dying fine step, kept putting it back up. Because she wanted the white because she wanted the white vote, right? And um, when she was mayor. And then so the first thing out of just Richard Bradley's mouth said, now how did you and first thing I asked him is like because I'm all about labor and work and stuff. And then how did you learn to climb up the pole, practice, practice, practice. The film's called Practice, Practice, Practice. Mm -hmm. So then I found the utility cat from Mansfield, and I was like, how do you get up on this pole? And how, you know, so it became him talking about working for the telephone company. You know, I don't you know if the viewer's down, when I, I mean, I don't care. But I'm getting to what, what the Richard Bradley was thinking and how he could courageously got up on that pole and got arrested every time, you know. You know, because he was passionate about something. And this guy, working the telephone company, is just as passionate about his work. Because people back home brag about, man, I'm the best mechanic. No, you ain't. You know, I hear people like, <laughs> they're bragging about their work. Man, I'm on that line. I'm working, you know. So people, you know, so people take pride in what they do and stuff. And people, in a, and people intellectualize what they do and stuff. So, so, uh, so all the stuff I'm doing is all about, you know, how, how like this worker takes pride in what he does, and this activist takes pride in what they do. And for me, they're equal. You know, they're me, they're equal. So the viewer has to kind of stay patient with me and whatever. I don't know. I'm just talking, but I hope I don't know. Well, you said what the question was a comment. So I made a comment. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? I hope I answered. I hope, I hope I answered. Oh no, no, we got uh, more Mansfield, more from Waddell. Yeah. Oh man. Um, You've done a lot of okay. Great, the last question. Okay. Yeah. You've done a lot of like great Midwest representation as far as like um, bringing up different musicians like um, Bootsy Collins and whatnot and um, in like Ohio is a home home place of fun. Ohio like players too from brothers. down there. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, I was thinking about just growing up in the Midwest. I grew up on like Ohio State's campus in the DIY scene, but I spent summers in Mansfield, in Detroit. Yeah. And I was introduced to like hip hop through that. And Techno, music has informed a lot of my work, and I'm looking yeah. at a lot of your films and um, thinking about when I think of like uh, folks like 
uh, like Quentin Tarantino or Spike Lee, they have, you, you think about their soundtracks, and I'm wondering, you mentioned music, how music has informed your work, and, oh, man. and why and how music has or has not been employed in your work. Yeah, there's, a, there's certain, certain films that have music in it, but not a lot, because I think it drives the narrative too much, and, and I can't get to the rhythm of it and stuff, but, um, but I think mostly soul. I mean, uh, you know, hearing a Curtis Mayfield soul track, and then what he takes, because I used to, just when I was young, I used to have these big old headphones, listen to the two, the eight track, does anybody know what that is? Anyway, listen to music like that. And then, then I remember it taking me somewhere. And so I want the films to kind of do, do that, you know, the rhythm. And then also, too, my, uh, my colleague who I make films with, uh, Claude Adrian Harris, now she just wrote a brilliant book about gospel music called When, when Sunday Comes. And now we're making films based on that book. Um, like short films, and and I like just reading about gospel music because it has these praise breaks in it, you know, in the music. So I've been so apparently I've been making praise breaks in my films, like this slight with disruption from what you're seeing to back to what you're seeing, you know, so to speak. So not the kind of three act play, but more like the disruption in it, so to speak. So I like that, um, so to, so to speak, a lot because I was a DJ too, but hip hop is not. I mean the mixing, I guess, but but I don't. I see that as separate art form, and not to what the. Um, but I think mostly soul music and what the soul was doing in the seventies, to me and stuff like that. Um, the music, but I mean, there's a lot. I mean, because here is why I always think you know, like you know, the blacks in America are super rich. We're be, rich because have all these kind of kind of cultural things, and I remember um in. in you know, now, like, if a Beyonce song now comes out October 18th, it's coming out October 18th. But back in the day, um, it slowly came out. Like, it started in Chicago and the, uh, Detroit. And I remember driving to Mississippi, you know, now 13 and a half hour, you know, hours. But as soon as we get there, you know, my cousin locks us in a hot-ass room and have us show her the latest dances so she can be ahead of the crowd down there. <laughs> so we're doing the, I don't know, the, I don't know what this is, <laughs> but I did it to death. <laughs> like James Brown. So anyway, so we do that, you know, so just kind of bring in culture. So I like the fact that we brought culture down or brought stuff down. And then they knew they were coming, so, they, so they were all excited and stuff. So I like these kind of regional kind of like dances and language and stuff. But, but I think actually dance, I think, more so than anything, because I used to be a dancer. And then the whole idea of constant movement, more so than, than, the, than, uh, the, than, the, than the soundtrack. So I'm seeing the repetition as like a dance, so to speak. And then um, I love um, Stanley Whitney. I think he teaches sometimes at Tyler, but he's an ab abstract uh, um, what the painter. But he's got a great thing about black culture he says oh uh, he says first we practice our dance moves and then we do our homework so i i like that quote because art first and then we do our homework so always art is in the community so i like the fact that we're all i don't care if we're doing dance i um hell like i drive to ohio uh, oh, oh, ohio from where virginia and then when my daughter was in high school and i'm wearing that i mean i got my bags and we're dancing <laughs> she's like trying to show me the news dances with the new trap moves and shit and my old ass is trying to do them, you know. But anyway, so, but I like the fact that she practices her dance moves first and then does her homework. So art is always ingrained in you, so to speak. So, so I think I'm more influenced by dance than I am by music. So anyway, but uh, right on. All right, all right, thanks. Thank you guys. Sweet. <laughs>